You are a Locked On Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta and part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Grant McCauley. He's Jake Mastriani. We come to you after a good weekend for the Braves, though Sunday was obviously a down note as their six-game win streak came to an end and they were denied a sweep of the Texas Rangers in a 6-4 loss. But all in all, another series win against a team in which uh, perhaps the Braves are catching them just at the right time. And the Braves will continue this nine-game homestand with a couple of more series to go. But we're going to get you uh, caught up on everything that happened over the weekend and on Sunday, of course, and look ahead to the Miami Marlins who roll into town starting on Monday for a three-game series. And we'll see the return of a familiar face on the mound. We will get to all of that as the postcast gets started. Go ahead, hit that thumbs-up button for us, though, and subscribe to Lockdown Sports Atlanta here on YouTube. Subscribe to Lockdown Braves wherever you get your podcasts. And before we get started... Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. Download the app today. Use the code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match of up to $100. Well, Jake, all in all, a good series against the Texas Rangers, a chance for the sweep early, but the lead for the Braves was not quite big enough and they could not hold on as the Texas Rangers offense, which we knew was a good one, finally came to life in the series finale. Street comes to an end is all uh, good things do, but unfortunately, Braves not able to get a sweep. But as you said, got a series win over the defending World Series champions. You got to keep that in mind, too. This is a good team with a good offense. I know they're missing some guys in the rotation, but a really good team. So, still to be able to get a series win against them, uh, another, you know, just positive for this Braves team in this early season. A feather in the cowboy hat, if you will, for the Atlanta Braves because uh, they bucked the odds and went ahead and messed with Texas over the last week and won five out of six. That's still pretty good. Tack that on to the two out of three they took from the Marlins to start that road trip. And overall, the Braves are on a really nice run of baseball right now. Even with their loss on Sunday, still one of the best records in the game. Uh, They just continue to play, I think, extremely well. You know, Jake, if they keep continuing to win series and they do that all the way through the end of the year, I've heard that really, really good things happen. And this is a club that's certainly capable of winning series. It's typically how you end up winning about 100 games, as the Braves have done the past two years. And I think they have a good shot to do that again this season, obviously very early to be thinking about that. But just with how deep this team is, even with some of the injuries they've had to sustain so far, you see it's just it's a lot of talent there and guys not producing, which I'm sure we'll talk about in today's episode as well, like they normally do. And they're still able to to put together wins against quality opponents like they have early on in this season. I mean, you look at you look at the schedule of the Phillies right now and they're doing, you know, they're doing what they need to do, but they're they're playing, you know, subpar competition and they're racking up the wins where, you know, I feel like the Braves have played some pretty tough teams and they're still able to get those wins despite missing some key contributors and I think that's just going to help them further down the road when they start to get some more of those easier matchups. Yeah, I agree. And that's just one of those things about a baseball season is you are going to catch some teams at the right time. You're going to get hot. You're going to go through some spells where you just can't figure out why you're losing games to teams that maybe you feel like you're not supposed to. But uh, we certainly can't say that the Braves should be feeling any kind of way like that after the way that they've been playing and particularly after the weekend that they just had against the Rangers. So as we look at the 6-4 loss on Sunday night with Darius Vines on the mound, the Braves staked him to an early lead, another home run for Marcel Ozuna. He just continues to impress here in the early going. That was a three-run shot that got it going, and the ball was flying on Sunday night at Truist Park. Despite the fact that it was kind of a chilly evening, the Rangers ran into a couple of pitches, a couple of change-ups from Vines in that fourth inning. They put up four runs, and that really started to swing the momentum around in their favor, and they're a club that they're no strangers to winning either. No, they're certainly not. And like I said, they have a really good offense and an offense that can do a lot of damage. And you saw it, even a guy in in Evan Carter, a young kid who's been struggling a bit this year, you know, he can take you deep. And certainly a guy like Darius Vines, I know we'll get more into his start too, but you got to be pinpoint and it's going to be tough to get through a lineup like that, you know, two or three times against that lineup and not do not have that much damage. And, you know, I thought he, he did okay with some damage control and pitching around this again against a good Rangers lineup. But uh, those home run balls tonight especially were, were very hurtful against the Braves. Yeah, and I think the big thing for Darius Vines, and we will talk a little bit more about his start as we go on, is as you go through a major league lineup that first time, you might have a little bit of an advantage, especially if you do things in, I won't call it an unorthodox fashion, but Darius Vines is looking to change speeds. He's looking to change the eye levels. He's not really trying to overpower you. That's not really his game. 
but uh, utilizing that change up and perhaps becoming a, a bit more reliant on that than he should be cost him on a couple of change ups that left the park in that fourth inning. All in all, though, you've got to be pretty impressed with the way that he has been able to come up and show you flashes of what he could be. But the Braves are going to make some changes to the way their rotation goes the next time through because they are going to bring up Bryce Elder in the series against the Marlins, something that we will talk a little bit more about later on. Uh, Braves had a big chance in the eighth inning of this one, Jake. It felt like if there was that opportunity, that golden opportunity to maybe change the whole complexion of this game, that was it. Two men on, Austin Riley comes through, basically getting second and maybe third life at the plate with some calls that, that went his way and didn't go David Robertson's way. And I don't know if he could have rolled the ball any better through the Texas infield to score a run there, but with runners on the corners and nobody out in a two-run game, uh, Robertson was able to buckle down and get a couple of hitters. Our old friend Kirby Yates came in, and the Rangers were able to put out that Braves rally, and nothing was doing in the ninth inning. But it did feel like if there was a chance, and the Braves typically find their way in a close game to at least threaten, that was the one in the eighth inning, and they just weren't able to come through. It's the thing with this offense. Look, you just kind of expect it. As I'm watching the game, I said, okay, this is going to be the chance where they come through and they take the lead or at least tie it up. It's just, again, what we've kind of come to expect from this offense, especially after, you know, Ronald, a 70 mile per hour blue pit comes in. Mm -hmm. Then you get the air on a Garcia in right field. And then Riley, as you said, a 53.2 mile per hour single. And okay, everything is breaking the Braves' way right yeah. here. You got Olsen, you got Ozuna coming up, Arcia, you know, Ozuna and Arcia specifically have been two of the Braves' best hitters so yeah. far this year. You figure, you know, this is it. This is when the Braves are going to do their damage and come back and win this game. And it just wasn't meant to be. You got to credit the pitchers uh, making some good pitches there. And or like you said, our old friend Kirby Yates coming in there and finishing it off. But yeah, I mean, just with the way that this Braves team is and the way the offense generally, especially late in games, has gotten things done, you felt like that was it right there. If they were going to make a comeback, it was going to happen then. Yeah, and there are some nights where you know those comeback opportunities are going to be there, but you're just not going to come through with that big hit. But far more often than not, it feels like the Braves have managed to find a way to win at a rate in which maybe you just don't expect them to be able to come through with some of these, but they just continue to amaze you. And it's not going to happen every single time, I guess is what I'm saying, long story short. And this was one of those nights where the Rangers were able to wriggle out of trouble and even though it felt like everything was going Atlanta's way, that momentum was starting to swing. You know, Credit David Robertson and Kirby Yates for making some big pitches and getting through the heart of the Atlanta lineup, which, as you pointed out, included Marcelo Zuna and Orlando Arcia. Not as much, you know, looking at the Matt Olsons and even the Austin Rileys of the world here early in the season. Those have been a couple of the driving forces for this Braves offense. Uh, Marcelo Zuna, though, he did something really big in that first inning. Ninth home run of the year, 27 runs knocked in. I know his hitting streak ended on Saturday in that Braves victory. Ozuna did work a key walk in that game. So, you know, not all bad over the weekend, most certainly for him and a series win for the Braves. But with Ozuna, I, I don't know where this ride is going to stop or if it's going to stop because the power run that he has been on since the start of May last year shows no signs of slowing down here with this torrid month of April. Yeah, it's. Again, we're looking at 11-17 OPS here. I mean, just what he's doing is incredible. Another walk tonight, an account where he fell, he got up 3-0, and then you know, pitcher nibbled a little bit here, got in the count 3-2. You got a meeting at the mound, and it was basically, okay, see if you can throw a perfect pitch here. If not, we'll walk him and take our chances with Arcia, who, again, has also been very good. That's just kind of the respect he's getting at the plate in the moment. But if you're missing, especially if you're missing inside, he is making you pay right now with some damage. Had a line out in this one as well that had an expected batting average over 600. So uh, it's just you know another incredible, it's not even an incredible start. It's just an incredible continuation of what we saw last year. Yeah, it's a 19 game on base streak for Marcelo Zuna now because even though the hit streak was over, he still drew that walk on Saturday. So he continues to find ways. And even with the rare over that he has, or he has a say a one for four, one for five kind of night, you still look back and, and you're right, you see this. 100-plus mile-an-hour line drive with a high-expected batting average right at somebody. Marcelo Zuna has been so locked in, and he has been a huge reason why the Braves' offense is doing the things it's doing here early in the season, while some other guys have struggled, especially lately. Matt Olson, what a rough night for him. 0 for 4, four strikeouts. Uh, Austin Riley hasn't really looked like himself on the homestand thus far. Those are a couple of bats you expect to get going, but it's key to have guys like Ozuna, Arcia, uh, Jared Kelnick to a certain extent, just others who have been able to kind of pick up the slack, come up with some big hits, because you're going to expect the Acunas, the Olsons, the Rileys, and the, and the guys like that 
are going to get theirs. They're going to get hot. They're going to do their share of carrying the club as well. Yeah, we all know that. We know those guys are going to get going at some point. And again, we just talk about it in the depth of this lineup and how good this team is where Acuna hasn't shown the power that we know he's going to show. And you're talking about Riley and Olsen, who now on are you know a little bit of a longer cold streak, at least by their standards. And yet the Braves still lead all of baseball with an 828 OPS. Second behind them is the Brewers at 789. So even a big lead there in the OPS department. And you're talking about three of the top four hitters in your lineup really haven't even hit their top potential yet. That just, again, speaks to the fact that this Braves lineup is the deepest, in my opinion, the best in all of baseball, when you can have those three guys not playing up to their all-star MVP level standards, and yet you're still the tops in the league offensively because the rest of the lineup is getting it done. Yeah, and I'll throw another one out there. Heading into Sunday, and I know they scored four runs on this night, but still averaging more than six runs per game through their first 20 games this year. That's pretty impressive when you think about the fact that some of these guys have yet to hit their stride. We have yet to hit our stride on this edition of the Braves Postcast. We have more to talk about. We'll get inside the line score and the box score. Talk a little bit more about Darius Vines night, uh, what didn't go right for the Braves, what went right for the Rangers, and what is ahead for the Braves pitching staff. All of that is coming your way as the Braves Postcast continues. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. FanDuel.com slash locked on is where you want to go. You can make your first bet an automatic win. That's FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Braves with a 6-4 loss on Sunday after a 5-2 victory on Saturday. Of course, we were with you after the Friday game in which Travis Darno went off. A continuation of that on Saturday as he hit his fourth home run in two days, and then he rested on the final day of the weekend, and the Braves fell by a 6-4 score to the Rangers, though we did see Travis Darno late, but not in the starting lineup in that one. Darius Vines was on the mound, unable to keep the Rangers in the ballpark in this one. Uh, let's go through the line score first for the Rangers. Six runs on 11 hits, one error. Texas left four men on base for the Braves, four runs on just five hits. They left five men on base, played errorless ball, uh, did they, the winner. In this one was Michael Lorenzen. He is now 2-0 and as he limited the Braves to three runs, all on the Azuna homer across six innings. Darius Vines, five innings of four-run ball, takes a loss. And we'll talk more about that here now. Uh, you know, the home run ball was what bit him, as I talked about, those change-ups. I'm not going to say it was necessarily, you know, becoming too predictable because, you know, the Rangers hadn't seen him a lot. But big league hitters, Jake, when you go through that lineup once and they kind of see what is your tendency, at least they know what to start hunting. And with Vines, I feel like the changeup is kind of that pitch for him. It has been effective in his in small doses here early on in his big league career, but not something you can necessarily rely on so much so that it does become a little bit more predictable than not. Yeah, that you look at the pitch mix for him tonight, and it's it's the one thing you look at and kind of question. 46% of the time he threw a changeup tonight. Yes, it's his best pitch. Yes, it's a really good one, but he also has a really good cutter that I thought was effective for him in his last outing, and he only threw that pitch four times tonight. And to me, that's the pitch he was getting the chases on off the plate, especially to righties in his last outing. And he only threw it four times tonight. So, again, it, it really reminds me of the Alan Winans start earlier in the year where first time through the lineup, he was dazzling hitters with that changeup. And then second time through against the Mets, they were sitting on it. They were ready for it because he kept featuring it. And eventually, as good as a pitch is, a major league team is going to adjust to that. And I just felt like he kind of stuck with that changeup a little too much. And I would like to see him go to – the slider even, that he had two whiffs on four swings against that pitch tonight. Uh, so I'd like to see him mix it up a little bit more uh, than he did tonight because it did seem that the Rangers seemed to adjust to that changeup. You know, I, I didn't really realize that it was the breakdown was that severe in terms of basically fastball changeup and very little else. I mean, I know he's not a huge breaking ball pitcher, but it seemed like he used his cut fastball at least a decent amount against the Astros to also help him out. So uh, you know, maybe it was just a matter of of trying to pick different ways to go about it. Maybe just being a little bit too predictable early in counts because that's what those home runs really came off of. It wasn't in deep counts after long at bats, but credit the Rangers and particularly Marcus Simeon to start the game with a very long at bat. So even though Texas didn't get to him that first time through, they saw a lot of Darius Vines to start kind of figuring things out in this one. The Rangers also got a two-run homer from Adolis Garcia. That came off Tyler Matzik later on. That proved to actually be a big difference maker in this game, a two-run shot in the eighth inning. The Braves, of course, put their rally together, scratched across a run, but fell by a 6-4 score. Uh, you and I have said a lot of, of complimentary things about Tyler Matzik, and I'm not ready to roll those back and retract any of them. Adolis Garcia is a great hitter, and he's a guy that's going to get you every once in a while. 
and he got Tyler Matzik with that opposite field right field shot. He did, and as you said, uh, a big big spot there in that game because it ended up being the difference there with the two-run home run. We talk a lot about the velocity of Matzik, and if you want to look at it tonight, it was down a little bit. It was more than 93-mile-per-hour variety. Again, I still think it's just location. That pitch was middle up, and Adolis, he can go get it pretty much anywhere you throw it. But you know, certainly with the power that he has, if he can get the, the bat up to that, he's going to drive it like he did. Uh, so, yeah, just an unfortunate outing here for Tyler Matzik, one he'd like to have back. Yeah, most definitely. The Braves, they had their chances as well in the bottom half of that inning, as we talked about earlier. It felt like Austin Riley might have had nine lines in his plate appearance. You mentioned that Adolis Garcia was unable to make that catch on Michael Harris. Of course, Ron Lacuna Jr. had just a nice little flare single to get it all started. Seemed like the Braves were maybe starting to feel like things were coming together for him. But as quickly as that happened, the strikeout of Olsen, that really felt like one that started to swing the momentum back towards Texas. Ozuna flies out and then uh, you have the out, the strikeout of Orlando Arcia as Kirby Yates came in the game, and he tossed a scoreless ninth. So uh, the Braves may be very familiar with Kirby Yates, but uh, when he's got it going, especially that splitter, he's going to be a tough customer to deal with, and he's had a very good run in the Texas bullpen to start the year. He's thrown scoreless ball thus far through the first three weeks of the season and might have established himself as a Rangers closer from this point forward. Yeah, Jose LeClerc kind of lost that job earlier in the year already and was um, mo moved down to kind of the middle in innings, and Kirby Yates kind of ran away with that. And I know Bruce Bochy said at the time they had planned to get LeClerc back in there, but Yates has thrown the ball so well, I think you're just going to ride it out with them. And look, we saw Yates have a good run with the Braves last year as well, and it's he's kind of doing what we hoped he would. He's finding that fastball at the top of the zone, and he's dropping that splitter out of the bottom of it, and that's exactly where Kirby Yates can be effective, that splitter can be such a, a difficult pitch to hit. And look, came in four four straight outs to shut things down uh, when the Braves had a chance there in the eighth. And then in the ninth, you were just looking for somebody to get on base to get Acuna back to the plate, and you couldn't couldn't get couldn't get it done. Even with Travis Darno, the hero of the weekend for the Braves coming in, Adam Duvall pinch it as well for Guillaume, and he couldn't get him on base either. Uh, so a great job by Kirby Yates, just shutting things down, not letting it get back to the top of the order. Yeah, Brian Snitker pulled all the levers that he could there in the ninth inning, bringing in Travis Darno and Adam Duvall, just trying to get something going, and it just wasn't to be. And Kirby Yates, another big reason for success. I know this is not the Rangers postcast, but he has cut that walk rate down uh, to a degree where he already wasn't allowing very many hits. Now he's just not allowing very many base runners at all. So enjoying some success in Texas is Kirby Yates. Meanwhile, for the Braves, uh, unable to come across the uh, runs that they needed late in this game, but as we talked about, uh, this is a series win for Atlanta. Five to two behind Charlie Morton uh, on Saturday's game or in Saturday's game. Jake, I know we talked a little bit about Charlie and what you wanted to see from him uh, after Friday's contest. And now I think we saw exactly what you wanted to see from Charlie Morton, who threw a very good game, a strong six inning outing for him. That's the kind of thing you'd like to see him make a habit out of, because if he does, you start to feel like this rotation, particularly with the news that Bryce Elder is now going to be coming back up and rejoining the starting five they might just start putting everything together. It was, certainly could, and we know that's possibility with Charlie Morton. And look, as, as much of the struggles it's been for him so far this season, we know what he's capable of doing when he's on. And I know CJ talked about it during the broadcast on TV that maybe we're seeing a little bit different version of Charlie Morton. I made a big point about the fact he's not getting the whiffs on the curveball, but he does seem to be throwing it in the zone a little bit more and getting some weak contact. And like if that's a strategy he's, he's employing, then – you know, great. I, I think that kind of worries me a little bit because what I love so much about Charlie Morton is he can go out there and strike out eight right. or nine. Right. And that's what you want. And I'm, I'm sure, I hope at least, you know, he can still do that. But either way, six innings, four hits, just the two walks. Look, I'll take that from Charlie Morton over six innings, especially if he's not giving up the home run, which he didn't on Saturday. Uh, but just four hits allowed, only four strikeouts. Again, you're used to a 200 strikeout pitcher in Charlie Morton. So again, if we are kind of Either it's reg regression or maybe he's just changing things up a bit and pitching more to contact. Whatever it is, we know he has the potential to be effective. And, yes, if he can continue to go six innings like this, two earned, three earned or less even, that's exactly what you're hoping for with Charlie Morton. Yeah, I mean, you'll take that because it's going to put you in position to win a game far more times than not with the way this Braves offense is going to hit far more times than not. It's interesting, though, with Charlie, as you pointed out, only the four strikeouts on Saturday. That was coming off of, what, a season-high eight against the Marlins the last time out? but they were extremely pesky and that hit column uh, was filling up a little bit. And of course the run column, more importantly, as he was unable to hold on to that five, one lead, the Braves though, were able to rally and win that game. So I guess all's well that ends well, but good to see Charlie Morton take a step forward over the weekend as well. Thought that was worth bringing up as we wrap up the Braves series win 
over the Texas Rangers. When we come back, we will start talking about what is ahead for this Atlanta Braves team, an update on their all-star second baseman, Ozzy Albies, that uh, might make you uh, breathe a sigh of relief. I know the Braves certainly will. And, of course, the return of Bryce Elder, who's going to be on the mound Monday when the Marlins roll into Truist Park. All of that's coming your way on the Braves Postcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. Download the app today. Use the code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match of up to $100. That is the code Locked On MLB as you download that Prize Picks app. Do that today. All right, the Braves and the Marlins will open up a three-game series as Atlanta continues this nine-game homestand. We'll talk a little bit about the rotation and the things that went right or that, that are now being lined up for the Braves as they get the Marlins into town. But something that went right over the weekend was a good update on Ozzy Albies, who uh, was able to avoid surgery for that fractured toe, not wearing a walking boot, moving around pretty well when I saw him the last couple of days, and has now graduated to doing fielding work, and he's got his spikes back on already. Jake, he's eligible to come off the injured list as soon as Friday. That would certainly be a big boost for this Braves club to not have to have uh, live without Ozzy Albies for weeks on end, waiting for him to come back from what is another frustrating injury. It'd be great to have his bat back in the lineup. He obviously kind of puts everybody else in their spots too. And just the leader that we talked about it, that he is in that clubhouse and for this team, certainly want him back in there as soon as possible. And we knew when he got injured and the fact that he played through it the rest of the game that we were hoping that meant that maybe it wasn't quite as severe and looks like maybe that is the case. The fact that he's already doing building drills and could be back maybe this weekend. We'll see. Maybe they, they might go the cautious approach with it uh, and with Ozzy Albies here, but either way, it sounds like we could getting him back sooner than maybe expected. Yeah, that would certainly be big for this Braves team. Yeah. As you look at the other moves that are made here with Ozzy Albies, perhaps back sooner than later, the Braves, you knew were going to make some changes to the starting rotation Darius Vines got a couple of opportunities. Alan Winans got his, but it always felt like, Jake, that they were looking to line things up so they could eventually get this back to Bryce Elder. It just didn't really time out that first couple of times through. Bryce Elder will be starting on Monday against the Miami Marlins, his first start of the year, but an all-star in 2023, a guy that I thought probably was going to open the season as the fifth starter before Reynaldo Lopez moved into rotation, and we'll talk about him in just a moment as well because the Braves shuffled their rotation around just a little bit. But the return of Bryce Elder, I always felt like this was how the Braves would uh, want to go at trying to fill the rather large void that has been left by Spencer Strider and bring some continuity to the back end of the rotation so they weren't playing that revolving door game. Yeah, t Braves are always 10 steps ahead of us, as we know, but it felt like this was going to happen eventually at some point. But as you said, things just didn't kind of line up with when the Strider news happened and where where Elder was kind of in his work and his rotation. But when you saw it, you know, rain out on Saturday for Gwinnett uh, in, or in Sunday, rather, and Elder not starting that game, it felt like it was a possibility that he could start on Monday and give everybody else an extra day of rest. And I think that's what Alex Anthopoulos in the front office are, are going to look to do all season long as you have guys like Ronaldo Lopez, who's moving back into the rotation. Chris Sale hasn't pitched a lot recently. Max Fried coming off an injury riddled season. They're going to look for opportunities like this, where maybe they can move things around, get a guy up uh, to give other guys an extra day of rest. And you know, the way that this plays out now, everybody gets another extra day of rest. So yeah, again, Braves just kind of 10 steps ahead of us all there and making it and getting that all planned out. But I hope you're right. And I hope this is Bryce Elder coming back up, getting a shot in the rotation, taking things that he learned from last season, being able to apply them this year and be that fixture in the rotation. And hopefully the Braves can have, you know, a couple of times through where they have these five going, kind of get on a roll and use that word that uh, you, you've said a lot here lately. And I certainly agree with that continuity. Uh, that you want in a starting rotation. Look, you never want somebody to get injured, but when you lose a pitcher in the first couple of weeks, you lose a pitcher like Spencer Strider, it's going to throw things off in your rotation for a while. But hopefully moving Elder in here, if he gets on a roll, he certainly has to perform, can bring that continuity to the starting rotation. Yeah, they could definitely use it. Elder made 31 starts last year in an all-star campaign, 12-4 and four with a 381 ERA, a tale of two halves for him. But Jake, 40 starts under his belt in his young career, and still, as you look at Bryce Elder, he's, what, just 24, going on 25 years old. So this is somebody that, you know, you knew you were going to hear his name again. You knew he was going to get another opportunity. You just didn't know what the circumstances were going to be. Unfortunately, those circumstances are being without arguably your best pitcher for the rest of 2024. 
But uh, as Spencer Strider said on Friday, this team is capable of winning the World Series without him, but they're going to need contributions from a lot of different guys, and I think Bryce Elder is definitely one of those guys. He is, and he's somebody, too, because of that experience that he has that you just mentioned, the fact that he was an all-star last year. I think he's somebody that Brian Snicker can trust to look – you need him to go out there and just give you another inning. You know, maybe he's already given up four runs or something like that, but you need him to just give you another inning to save the bullpen. I feel like he can do that for you. Or maybe you're up big and you kind of want to save the bullpen. He's just that guy that I feel like there's a little bit more trust with than maybe there is with the Darius Vines or an Allen Winans. It just doesn't have that, that track record that Bryce Elder already has. And like you just mentioned, a very young career. But I think he's somebody that maybe Brian Snicker can have a little bit more trust in. Yeah, and like you said, I mean, with Charlie Morton, if you're getting six innings of three runs or less, you're going to feel pretty good about that. If Bryce Elder can do anything close to that, anything close to what he did a year ago, and I don't mean you know pitching his way to the All-Star game after joining the rotation, uh, after being the opening day starter in Gwinnett the way he did a year ago, it was a crazy story. I didn't have him opening in AAA again this year, but again, you know, th- we have a lot of different stories and a lot of different things that develop beginning in spring training, or I guess really developing beginning in the winter with the signing of Reynaldo Lopez. So uh, let's set the scene now for this uh, for the continuation of this nine-game homestand. It's a three-game set against the Miami Marlins. The Guardians will follow next weekend, but Atlanta has announced its starters now for the Miami series. Bryce Elder, then it will be Max Freed, then it will be Reynaldo Lopez. So everybody will get that extra day that you mentioned, Jake, and it lines them up against this Miami club that was playing them tough over the last weekend. Bryce Elder, of course, no stranger to the Marlins. He's faced them several times over the last couple of years. And I think he's going to be excited to just continue, I think, not trying to do too much, not trying to make huge adjustments, but just go out there and give the Braves, uh, as as we talked about, a quality start, a chance to win. And if he does that, I feel like, again, more times than not to play this broken record, he's Mm -hmm. going to end up in a pretty good spot, and so are the Braves. Yeah, look, looking forward to see what he can do and coming back up, like I said. I mean, in spring training, I know maybe the results weren't exactly there, but you look at some of the Stuff Plus models that I know Eno Saris, the athletic, very big on. I've heard him talk about the fact that the stuff actually played up better than last season for Bryce Selder in spring training. And last start out at Gwinnett, six innings, seven strikeouts, three earned. Again, it's triple A to major leagues, but you do that for the Braves tomorrow. I feel like you got a pretty good chance of winning the game. And as you said, most times out there, if you do that with this offense, I feel like it's going to give you a pretty good chance to win the game. So looking forward to seeing what Bryce Elder can do. Marlins winning a couple games here lately, just split a four game series with the Cubs. So, you know, maybe they're starting to get some guys healthy too. Everett Cabrera back for them. Uh, Ryan Weathers been pitching a little better too. So we'll see what the Marlins can bring in this series, but Bryce Elder, Hopefully he can get back on track at the big league level. And I believe it had been a long time between starts for Bryce Elder as well, maybe nine or 10 days. And I think it was three runs in the first and nothing else the rest of the way. So that kind of speaks to the point you were making where maybe there is a bad inning, but you kind of allowed this guy to work through it and figure it out. And he can do that. You brought up Ryan Weathers. He'll be on the mound, the lefty for the Marlins against Bryce Elder in game one of this three game series, a 721st pitch time against the Marlins in game one of that series. That's going to bring us to the end of this edition and this uh, weekend for the Braves. A pretty good one as they won a series against the Rangers. And we will wrap up this edition of the postcast and invite you to stick with us throughout the course of the rest of the week. We'll have plenty more to bring you. Make sure you're subscribed to Locked On Sports Atlanta here on YouTube. Leave us those likes and those comments. Share the show with a friend and subscribe to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcast. Braves and Rangers, two out of three for the Braves. That ain't bad. Next up, a three-game set with the Marlins. For Jake Mastriani, I'm Grant McCauley. We will catch you next time. And until then, so long, everyone.